Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Seventh Day Church of Revelation. The scripture tells us in Hebrews 12, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living King, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Right? When we come to the cross, that's what we've come to. To the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to the God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Okay? And that's what we want to emphasize here in the the scripture. It's to the spirits of just men, uh, the minds of just men that are made perfect, that are being perfected. And unto Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of of sprinkling that speaks of better things than the blood of Abel. Amen? What does the blood of Abel speak? It speaks condemnation. But the blood of Jesus speaks hope. It speaks forgiveness and remission of sins that he takes away from us. I want to begin with a prayer. Father in heaven, as we enter this study time, as we enter this time where we focus on the words of Scripture and the counsel in the spirit of prophecy, as we enter this time, we ask that you will illumine our minds. We ask that we will open our ability to perceive truth, that you will speak to our hearts. Lord, I know I've, in this study I've learned mistakes that I have made, but I ask that now, as we get into it, that you will help us to see how we can correct, we can be reproved and corrected and perfected in our work through thy scriptures, through thy word. I pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So a little outline of what we'll be covering. The first topic will be the Nicolaitans. If you don't know what we're talking about, you'll see in a minute. The mixed multitude, the tares, and the foolish virgins. So let's begin with the study on the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans, they are mentioned in Revelation chapter 2, but to the church of Smyrna and the church of Pergamos. Revelation 2.14 This is the church of Pergamos. Jesus says to them, this is Jesus speaking, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So what did Balaam do? He taught Balak to put things sacrificed to idols, to seduce them into eating things sacrificed to idols, and to commit fornication. Okay, so idolatry and adultery, idolatry and fornication. And then it says, So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. And so this is a Greek name, obviously, Nicolaitans. It's mentioned in Acts chapter 6, that there is a, a deacon in, that, in the church at uh, Antioch. There was a deacon by the name of, of Nicholas. Similar to my name. My name is Nikolai, though. It's a little bit different. Some, and so he had that name, Nicholas, at the church there in Antioch. And so some say it's, that it's uh, a people that came after his time, or people after, and, and assumed his honorary name and called themselves Nicolaitans, which wouldn't be unusual. Uh, some other scholars say, no, 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 it's someone else that came later with the same name and was teaching these doctrines, the eating food sacrificed to idols and uh, to practice fornication. At least that's what Daniel Revelation says. And Daniel Revelation leans towards actually being the latter. There was a man who came later, not the same person in Acts chapter 6. And so we'll lean with that. that, that that's most likely based on their study. I haven't investigated that, that too far, so I'll take the, the study of the, those men back in the pioneers who studied that. Now, he taught them to cast a stumbling block, right? And that's what it was, it was a stumbling block, because we know in the Old Testament that when the people of God were faithful, that they had the blessing of God upon them. 
why Balaam could not curse them. But when they fell into sin, then they could be cursed. Then they were subject to Satan's power. And so that's what is happening. There's a stumbling block that's being put before them to practice some form of idolatry, in this case, eating food offered to idols, and what? What's the other one? Fornication. Fornication. Now, that's how it all culminated in fornication. There is also the belief that they actually had open marriages or kind of a community of, of, believe, of people, not believers, believers, wrong word, of, of people that shared wives or open marriages. It was, it was a very loose thing. So the Nicolaitans, in summary, practiced open sin. Bottom line, they practiced open sin. Now, this isn't a problem way back there. It's easy to look at it. That's a problem there in the first century. It's a problem way back there. No, it's a problem for us today. And it's worse today. Because today, men and women are not only committing fornication, but they're turning against nature, according to Romans 1.26. I want to give an example of this. This is a pastor. You probably have seen this if you look on social media, but... This is a pastor, Pastor Sasha Gunjevic, the first pastor to come out as a bisexual. He came out in Germany in his sermon on January 7th of this year, January 7th, 2023. And the uh, Hans Conference in Germany maintained his credentials in March, even though he came out. Then there was this book released Actually, I think this was in May or March. I can't remember which month. But it was a book that was released. And it's um, the Bible and the LGBTQ Adventists. And it's received endorsements from at least seven ministers within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. An eighth one, I think it's, he's out of Idaho, I think it is. Kevin McGill actually was helping, supporting it by saying people should donate to this book on Kickstarter to, for the funding of this book um, to support it financially. This was on uh, June 17, yeah, June it was, oh, 2021. This is a while ago, not, not so recent. But this book has recently been recommended by at least seven ministers within the Seventh-day Adventist Church to people. Okay, so what does the General Conference do to, about this? The General Conference responds to this by saying, that they are trying to reach out to these local problems. They call them local problems that are developing. That's in a sense true, logistically. It's not the general conference that's promoting these things. It's local ministers, local pastors that are doing this. Now, that's fair to say that. And Christ-like love and compassion for all people. And I say, that's fine, but Christ-like, what does Christ say? Repent, right, lest I come and fight against you with the words of my mouth, with the sword of my mouth. Let's use the words of Christ if we're going to claim we're going to do in the manner of Christ. Let's be very clear about it. Christ is clear about these problems. Then this... Um, now, when you're receiving money from the federal government and as a health care system, you're obviously tied to some obligations. That's fair. I can't say, no, no, you're of that persuasion. I can't offer you services. I get that. But to offer gender affirming, this is where it gets sticky. This is where you need to be careful. So they're offering gender assignment rooms based on, on gender identity. So let's say you as a woman going to the hospital, you need some care, and there's another person that comes in, and he's a man, but he says, I'm a woman. Well, he's put in the same room with you. And so even though he identifies as a, as a woman. So they're going to follow that based on federal guidelines rather than biblical principle rather than following nature and biology. So this is turning against nature. You see, this is where the church has been heading now. I mean, I pray, you want to pray for the welfare of all, right? We should, we're bringing these out to say we should pray that they heed the words of Christ. But how should we regard, how should we regard the deeds of the Nicolaitans? Well, Christ told the church of Ephesians, the Ephesus, Ephesian church, he says, but thou hast this, but this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And mind you, their deeds were what? Idolatry and fornication. They weren't unnatural sins, like Romans 1.26. 
Now what happens in Romans 26? What does Paul say there? Does God call, say that he calls them to repentance? No, in Romans 1.26 it says God gave them up. And I know Mac, the Maxwellian people, the God does not punish, destroy, or anything like that people, will say, well, this is, speaks highly of the character of God. And I say, well, yeah, but it also shows that God gave them up. You know what? The Bible says, those whom I love I chasten, not give up. I'd rather be chastened than be given up. I don't know about you. I'd much rather be chastened than given up. And so, uh, you know, they, they take that and twist it to mean, see how loving God is. No, God is saying, I can't work with you anymore, so I'm not going to. That's what that's saying. It's not a good thing. You know, um, how that reflects on God's character is besides the point, right? It's besides the point. But let's see it for what it is. In uh, Revelation 2.16, Jesus says, Repent, or I will come against thee quickly, and will fight against them, against those who commit those, uh, the fornication and idolatry. I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. That's what Jesus is saying. Repent, or I'll come and fight against you. He's not saying, oh, you know, let, let them work, let them give them time. No, it's repent, or I'll quickly, because I'm coming quickly, and I'll fight against you. Paul tells us, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. What are we to do? Reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Right? Same thing as Jesus is saying. Paul is saying nothing different. He's saying reprove them. Jesus is saying repent or I'll come and fight against you. Same idea. But all things that are reproved, Paul says, are made manifest by the light. For whatever doth make manifest is light. The Nicolaitans practiced open, carnal sin. And they must be reproved in the manner of Christ. They must be. And what's the manner of Christ? Repent, or I will come quickly and fight against them with the words of my mouth. That is what the church is to do. Will they do it? Let's pray they will. Should we be doing it? Yes, we should. We don't have to deal with the unnatural affection among us, but we may need to deal with fornication, we may need to deal with idolatry, or other sins among us. And we need to use the counsel and words of Jesus. That's the Nicolaitans, okay? These practice open, carnal sins. Are we clear on that? The Nicolaitans. What about the mixed multitude? <clears throat> the mixed multitude. Let's read about it in Exodus 12. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 on foot. There were men besides children. So 600,000 men on foot, that's besides women and children, right? And a mixed multitude went up also with them, and the flocks and herds and very much cattle. So after three days journeying here, they began to complain, the mixed multitude. They were the first one to complain about their journey. They had been convinced by the plagues to believe in the God of the Israelites, right? They were convinced. Now, some of them may have been Egyptians, but most of these mixed multitude were Jews, Hebrews, who had married with Egyptians. So that's why they were mixed. They were mixed marriages. You know, it may have been an Egyptian man to a Hebrew woman, or a Hebrew man married to an Egyptian woman, but that was the case. They were a mixed multitude. And so they were continually finding fault and complaining with the direction of Mo Mo Moses. Um, they were a continual source of trouble for Israel because of their murmurings and complaint. It kind of spread throughout the camp. And it's fascinating to us as we think of it, as we read about this, because they had the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night but they complain against Moses. And it's like, no, <laughs> Moses is representing that pillar of cloud, <laughs> right? He's representing the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. He's not doing whatever he wants to do. He's doing whatever God tells him to do. So you're complaining against that. You're not complaining against that God. This is who you're complaining against. The Moloch's multitude came up from Egypt, a source of continual temptation and trouble, 
Uh, they profess to have renounced idolatry and to worship the true God. But their early education and training had molded their habits and character. Had what? Had molded their habits and character. And they were more or less corrupted with idolatry and with what? Irreverence for God. Do we have that among us sometimes? Oh, yes. And we need to be cautious of that when we see reverence towards God, especially the Bible stories and things like that. We need to be cautious about irreverence. They were often as the Moans, the ones to stir up, to stir up strife, and were the first to complain, and they leavened the camp with their idolatrous practices and their murmurings against God. Oh, they murmured against Moses, but Moses is only giving them the words of God. Right? The people of Israel were especially, and especially the mixed multitude, would be constantly disposed to rebel against God. So this, this mixed multitude were disposed, because of their habits, because of their upbringing, they were disposed to rebel against God. The mixed multitude are corrupted with idolatry and with irreverence and disposed to rebellion. So they don't practice open carnal sin. You see the, hear the difference? Unlike the Nicolaitans who are very open, you know, and they have open marriages and idolatry and all this, you know, kind of yuck stuff. We would think now, we look at it like, oh yeah, we proved that, you know. Most of us would think would agree. But these people, these people have an irreverence. They've been con corrupted by their upbringing. And they have an irreverence towards God and a, a tendency towards idolatry. How to deal with the mixed multitude? How should we deal with them? Before we get to that question, we've got to ask the question, how did God deal with them, right? How did God deal with the mixed multitude? And this is interesting, Exodus 32. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, that I may consume them, and I will make thee a great nation, he says to Moses. I'll make you a great nation, Moses. Let me consume them. And Moses besought the Lord, his God, and said, said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy face fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and hast said unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven, and all, and all this land that I have spoken of, I will give unto your seed, that they shall inherit it forever. So Moses pleading with God, and the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. The Lord turned away by the plea of his servant Moses. He turned away from the plan to destroy them. Now justice re demanded that. It would have been fair for God to consume them. After God had provided them, they were in good health. They had all their needs met. They were lusting after what? After the fish and the meats, right? They wanted the food, the food of Egypt. And uh, God says, no, I provided everything you need. You have no needs and you can murmuring against me. A pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. You have opened my protection, even visibly before your sight. It would have been perfectly fair for God to destroy them. But as Moses interceded for Israel, his timidity was lost in his deep interest and love for those for whom God had, in the hands of God, been the means of doing so much. The Lord listened to his pleadings and granted his unselfish prayer God had proved his servant. He had tested his faithfulness and his love for that erring, ungrateful people. And nobly had Moses in, endured the trial. His interest in Israel sprang from no selfish motive. The prosperity of God's chosen people was dearer to him than personal honor, dearer than the privilege of becoming the father of a mighty nation. And so he have been proven that he had God's character in him. God was pleased with his faithfulness, his simplicity of his heart, and his integrity. And he committed to him as a faithful shepherd 
the great charge of leading Israel to the promised land. So God, in this case, proved his servant. So the mixed multitude and the trials that they come can be used to, to what? To prove the faithfulness of God's faithful servants. It can be used to prove. But how should we deal with them? How should we deal? That's how God dealt with them. He used, he used the faithful people and the mixed multitude to prove his people. But how should we deal with the mixed multitude? Separation. That's what the Bible says. Let's look at Deuteronomy. Thou shalt not abhor an Edomite, for he is thy brother. Thou shalt not abhor an Egyptian, because thou wast a stranger in his land. The children that are begotten of them shall enter into the congregation of the Lord in their third generation. In their third. So that first generation was not to be included in the, in the, among the people of Israel. In fact, Patriarchs and Prophets tells us that they were even encamped on the outskirts. They were not encamped among the different positions. They were kept on the outer, out, outside. And now on the day, day of Nehemiah, same thing. We read, Now it came to pass when they heard the law that they separated from Israel all the mixed multitudes. There was a mixed multitude in Nehemiah's day. And what did they do? They separated from them. So they had separation. The people of God are to guard themselves from the mixed multitude. Those who are irreverent, those who are disposed to rebel, those who have um, you know, you know, been tainted and corrupted by idolatry uh, of any kind, we are to be very guarded with them, right? We don't have, of course, we don't all share the same plot of land. We don't all live in the same place together, you know, and to say, okay, you guys live over there. We're going to live over here. No, we can't do that now. We live, we're scattered. But we are to be guarded. We are to be guarded with those people. While Christ is at work to preserve a pure church in the earth, Satan ever seeks to counteract his agency and work ever seeks to counteract his agency and work. So we ought to be careful with that. The mixed multitude are corrupted with idolatry, as we said, and irreverence, and they're disposed to rebel against God, and the people of God must be guarded from their rebellion. So we understand now, the Nicolaitans, open sin, and the mixed multitude are just corrupted people. They're not reverent. We've got to be careful with them and be guarded with them. The Nicolaitans, we reprove, we correct, and we have to remove if they, from their church if they are not repenting. Another class is the tares. Let's look at the tares. We can read about them in Matthew 13. Jesus speaking says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, I'm sorry, is likened unto a man, which soweth good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence come then these tares? And he said unto them, an enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we should go after them, uh, uh, gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. In the time of harvest, I will say unto the reapers, Gather ye together the first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn." We're familiar with this, right? There's the wheat and the tares. And then Jesus interprets the, the parable. He says, He answered, said to them, He that soweth the good seed is who? The Son of Man. Why right? Christ sows good seed. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. What are the good seed? The children. In this case, it's not the seed is not the word of God, right? It's not the truth. In this parable, the seed is the good children, the, the seeds of the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. 
The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. And therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the, in the fire. So shall it be in, the, in our time now, right? No, no, not now. So shall it be in the end of the world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of the, his kingdom all things that offend, and them that do iniquity, and shall cast them out into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So the children of the kingdom we have here, and then we have the children of the enemy that are brought into the church. And should we shove them out? Should we pull them out? No. I mean, that's not what Jesus is telling us to do. Because if we shove them out, we shove out the good wheat as well. You know, we read in Spirit Prophecy, she says, Satan never sleeps. He's watching and improves every opportunity to set his agents, okay, to scatter error which finds good soil in many unsanctified hearts. Satan never sleeps. So his agents come in. God may have sent people that are yet unsanctified, but his Satan's agents are there to do what? To scatter error. They're there to scatter the error. To scatter the error. And it finds good soil where? In those unsanctified hearts. It finds good soil there. So tares, what they do, tares scatter error. That's what they do. They're brought in by Satan. They're brought in by the enemy. But they scatter error. And the interesting thing is that the good servants, the servants of God, can identify it, right? Because of the error, we can identify, hey, this is error. Now, we, we can't say there are tears to their face or, or to anyone, really. We've got to be cautious of that, of course. But, uh, and we'll read about that here. Now, this has practical implications. One little point here I wanted to bring out. These unions, the trade unions, are one of the signs of these last, day, last days. Men are binding up in bundles ready to be burned. They may be church members, okay? They may be church members, but while they belong to these unions, they cannot possibly keep the commandments of God, for to belong to these unions means to disregard the entire Decalogue. So uh, take that caref carefully. If you are listening or anywhere here and you have belonged to a union, uh, take that carefully. That, that's, you cannot belong to it. And in my, where I've worked as a nurse, they wanted to unionize many times. I've always spoken against it, and so far it has failed. So praise the Lord so far, but we'll see how that, that could change quickly because there's constantly a push, constantly a push to, to unionize the company. How to deal with tares? How do we deal with them? We know the devil plants them. We know they scatter error. What do we do with them? And this is taken out of actually a situation that happened about the 1860s. Uh, between the, I believe it was E.J. E. J. H. Wagner and, and James White and some of these people dealing with some errors that were coming in the church. And she says, if faithfulness and vigilance had been preserved, if there had been no sleeping or negligence upon the part of any, the enemy would not have had so favorable an opportunity to sow tares among the wheat. Right? If you had not, we had not been sleepy, if we had not been so... So distracted and, and sleepish, the enemy would have had no opportunity. We read that we are to work carefully. There is danger of doing too much to cure the difficulties in the church, which if let alone, frequently will work out their own cure. It is bad policy to take hold of matters in any church prematurely. We shall have to exercise great care, patience, and self-control, and to bear these things and not go to work in our own spirit to set these things in order. So what do we do with the tares? We have to exercise great care. Great care. Okay? 
The mixed multitude, what is the mixed multitude? Keep them arm's length, right? We need to be very guarded with the mixed multitude. But with the tares, you have to ex exercise great care. The mixed multitude are irreverent. They're kind of light about things. But these people have a doctrine on their lips. They have something they want to teach, something they want to say to the church, a book they want to give, right? They want to pass around. We have to exercise great care, great care with such people because they're sympathizers with them and they ca those sympathizers can cast a great influence on the church. So great carefulness. Tares scatter error. Tares require great carefulness. Great carefulness. All right. That's the Nicolaitans, right? We can be very open with them. We prove their open sin, the Nicolaitans. The mixed multitude, we need to be very guarded with them, practice separation. And the tares, we need to be very careful. And I think what that means in each case, we need to go to the Lord in prayer. Because in our own strength, we can't deal with any of these people. We can't deal with Nicolaitans, with mixed multitude, or with tares. We can't. We have to ask the Lord's counsel, bottom line. We have to ask him to lead us. So great carefulness with the tares. Careful in our, our words and deportment and everything. What about the foolish virgins? You remember the parable, parable of the foolish virgins? Why Jesus is sitting there by the mountainside in Christ's object lessons we read, how he's sitting there and he sees a wedding coming there and there's some of the virgins who didn't have the oil and they, were, they went to buy some and they came late and Jesus points out how this represents the people at the end of the age, right? Who... Those who are wise partake of the Spirit. And those who are not don't partake of the Spirit. And they are shut out. And we read here, The class represented by the foolish virgins are not hypocrites. They have a regard for the truth. They have advocated the truth. They are attracted to those who believe the truth. They have not yielded themselves to this, this Holy Spirit's working. You see, they've done everything for the truth. They're, they love the truth. They have no problem with the truth. But what have they not done? They have not yielded. They have not submitted. They have not surrendered their, to the Holy Spirit to work in their lives. They have not fallen upon the rock, Christ Jesus, and permitted their old natures to be broken up. This class are represented also by the stony ground hearers. That's interesting. By the stony ground hearers. They receive the word with readiness but they fail of assimilating its principles. Its influence is not abiding. The Spirit works upon man's heart according to his desire and consent implanting in him a new nature. But the class represented by the foolish virgins have been content with a superficial work. A superficial work. And then we've read about this before. These quotes I shared with you in a previous message. This is from Christ's Object Lessons. They do not know God. They have studied his character. They have not studied his character. They have not held communion with him. Therefore, they do not know how to trust, how to look and live. Their service to God denigrates into a form. Superficial. This is the class that in a time of peril are found crying peace and safety. They lull their hearts into security and dream not of danger. It is in a crisis the character is revealed when the earnest voice proclaimed at midnight, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. The sleeping virgins were all awakened, right? All were aroused. Both parties were taken unawares, but one was prepared for the emergency and the other was found without preparation. Superficial work. Did not assimilate, did not assimilate the, the truths, did not apply them to their lives. A superficial work only. How do we deal with the foolish virgins? How do we deal with Christ's peace and safety? How do we deal with them? Let's look at what she says. We cannot now distinguish, nor have we authority to say who are wise and foolish. There are those who hold the truth in unrighteousness, and these appear just like the wise. 
our work is to have a preparation of heart that we may not be surprised as were the foolish virgins. Can't do anything about foolish virgins. You can only make sure you're not one of them. You can only make your calling election sure. Don't worry about the foolish virgins. Okay? Don't worry about them too much. Pray for one another. Yes, we are to bear one another's burdens, but you hold the truth, right? You believe the truth. You love the truth. You proclaim the truth. Apply it. Assimilate it. Ask the Lord to show you, where am I not following it? And ask the Lord to do that for your, other, for your brethren. That's all you can do is pray for other brethren like you would for all oh, the tares or the mixed multitude or for the Nic Nicolaitans, for any one of those groups, right? So here's a summary. So we know the Nicolaitans, they practice open carnal sin. What do we do with them? Reprove them. Call them to repentance. Turn. And if not, they must be disciplined and removed. What about the mixed multitude? Well, they're corrupted with idolatry, levity, irreverence towards God, right? They're disposed to rebel. What are we to do with them? We're to be guarded against them. We're not to mingle with them too much. We're to limit our contact with them. Kindly, show common courtesy. Let's not be rude to anyone. But be guarded with them. Be guarded around them. What about the tares? You know, they scatter error. What do we do with them? Well, those require great carefulness. Those require you to get on your knees. Right? Get on your knees and ask the Lord to guide you what to do with them, how to deal with those who scatter error. What do you do with them, Lord? Because if I treat them like a Nicolaitan, or like a mixed multitude even, it may offend a sympathizer. It may throw a sympathizer out of the church, one of whom God is working one who's still learning and trying to learn to follow the truth, trying to grow in Christ, the one may be just totally put off if you treat him like a mixed multitude or if you treat him like a, like a Nicolaitan. And the foolish virgins we just mentioned, right? We need to pray for one another and pray for ourselves and ask the Lord to show us how we are to be corrected. Last verse. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? Whence come they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That is the pure church. That is the true church. And that is your duty. Heed the words of Christ and treat Nicolaitans like Christ asks us to treat them. Reprove them. Treat the mixed multitude like the Bible tells us to treat them. Keep them, don't mingle too much among them. Be cautious, be guarded with the mixed multitude. And treat the tares with care. Great carefulness, great wisdom, lots of prayer, lots of patience, lots of self-control. I've made mistakes in these areas. I read this study, I'm not saying that I'm standing here before you telling you I've got it all figured out, no. I've made lots of mistakes in the past, in the corporate church and in this movement, in these areas. But we need to learn from Christ how to deal with these people. Let us pray. Father in heaven, your scriptures gave us warning about the groups of people that are among us. They be Nicolaitans, they be a mixed multitude or tares. You've warned us. You've told us how to, how to care for them, how to deal with them, how to approach them. I pray that we will turn to the scriptures seeking that counsel for each of these classes of people, and that we apply it to our lives. Father, our desire is to be wise virgins. I pray that each one will commit their ways to you fully, without reservation, with a complete yielding, a complete surrender, that we all may be wise virgins. We plead for this in the name of Jesus, who warned us of the things we read, who taught us of the things that we studied. And we, we plead in his name that you will indeed make us the wise virgins. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've been blessed by this video, please like, subscribe, and comment below. To support Seventh-day Church of Revelation, visit revelation.org.